It's good to see everyone. If you would uh, turn back in your Bibles once again to the Gospel of John. Get used to hearing that. You're going to be hearing that for a few years now from now. So the Gospel of John. We are entering into a study of this great, great book. We finished up Second Peter, I guess at the end of April. Did some topical studies, and now we come to a study on the Gospel of John. Those introductory verses were read to you earlier. And I would just say this, one theologian put it this way, Leon Morris said, John is a book of wonder and complexities. He said it is like a swimming pool. A child can wade in it and an elephant can drown in it. He says, that kind of a book, end of quote the same time. You can wade in this book and you can drown in this book. It's got simple truths, simple truths that we would give to a new believer to encourage them and get them started in their Christian life. It's got truths that would help them understand the gospel, that Jesus is the door and that he's the only way to salvation. We even have tracks made of just the gospel of John alone that we hand out to people because it's a good evangelistic tool as well for the unbeliever to understand who Jesus is and what he did. But it's also got complexities in it. We've got the doctrine of the Trinity in this book. Jesus, the Word, as we saw earlier, is with God and is God at the same time. That's a great and tremendous truth that this book highlights over and over again. What you do with Jesus Christ is the most important thing about you. I'll say that right off the front. And this book makes that really clear. It makes a big deal about Jesus. It makes a big deal about Christ. It confronts you with Christ over and over again because what you believe about Christ is everything. Everything. He is either the object of your love or he is your eternal judge. There's no neutral ground with Jesus, there's just no neutral ground. You're either with him or you're against him. He's your savior or he's your judge. Very clear. And will stand out to us as we go through the book of John. He is the good news personified. He is born but always existed. And how you respond to him is everything. You may know others, and you may believe others, and you may love others, but that doesn't matter. Jesus is the issue. Your knowing him and loving him is the issue, and that will be so clear in this gospel. Christ is everything, and that's what I have come to appreciate as I've gone, been going back through this gospel again in preparation for this study. He is everything. I pray as a church that we will come to love Jesus more, that we will know Jesus better. I pray that if you're not a Christian, that you will open, that God will open your heart to grasp and embrace the glory. We beheld his glory. Only God can do that. Only God can cause you to see him as glorious as he really is. It's not going to be just the information of this study that will do that. It will be God using the words of Scripture to open your heart to the great truths of who He is. The author is John. How do we know that? How do we know that? Because it certainly doesn't say, I, John, son of Zebedee, write. He doesn't say that. But he is the author of this gospel based on external evidence based on church tradition, based on Polycarp, who was an early church father, disciple of John, told some other people. Irenaeus wrote about it, John being the writer of this gospel, and several other early church fathers affirmed that in their writings. There's no reason to deny tradition in this situation at all. 
That's just the external evidence that we have. Because John doesn't say John wrote it, and John doesn't even put his name in the book anywhere. The internal evidence, look at verse 14 in John 1. The internal evidence, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and notice we saw his glory. The we saw, the author is an eyewitness. We're told in that verse. We saw. Go to chapter 19. Jump way to the back. John chapter 19. And this chapter deals with the crucifixion of Christ. And verse 35 of chapter 19 says, And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. I was an eyewitness to the spear being pierced into his body. I was a witness to the crucifixion. The only disciple that was present at the crucifixion was John, we are told, because it's John to whom Jesus says, Behold your mother, referring to take care of Mary. He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Probably not, it's not a name he gave himself. It's a name that most likely believers in the early church gave to him, a nickname that was given to him. Go to chapter 21. Chapter 21. Peter, verse 20, Peter turning around saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. This is the scene after the resurrection and they're gathered there on the seashore and they're fishing and uh, Jesus has made an appearance to them. The one who, who also leaned, the one whom Jesus loved, who also leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? You can read more about that in John 13, but the point is, just stay with me now in this chapter. Verse 21, so Peter seeing him said to Jesus, Peter seeing this disciple said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then verse 23, therefore this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple would not die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want to, him to remain until I come, what is that to you? you. Verse 24, this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. The author of the book of John, uh, of John is, uh, was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was present at the Last Supper, we learned from this passage. He was at this event in John 21. If you do the math right, equals John. Go to 21.2. Go back up to verse 2. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. So you've got this group of disciples in this John 21 event at the seashore. Point is... The author of John has to be one of the people in that group right there, okay? We know it's not Simon Peter, not Thomas and Nathaniel. Sons of Zebedee are John and James. James was martyred, so James couldn't have wrote it, and two other disciples were together. So it has to be one of these individuals Peter, James, and John were very tight, very close, associates of Christ. Interesting that, Pete, that John's name is not mentioned. I think it's proof by omission, as some will say, that while you would take the time to list other names of disciples throughout the book and not mention your own, it must be John. It must be John. He doesn't mention himself, and he writes, so he writes this gospel 50 years after the events. He lived in Ephesus. He was most likely one of the pastors there in Ephesus in his aged years. Not certain of the date that he wrote this. 80 to 90 AD is the consensus among most 
Bible scholars. So it's a very late, very late writing, 50 years after the events that he's talking about. He writes the Gospel of John, followed by, very old man, followed by 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Eventually, he is sent to the island of Patmos, and he writes the book of Revelation. This was a bu- busy elderly man, okay? That's my point from last week. A very busy elderly man with a very, very strong ministry going on. It does seem that John is familiar with the synoptic gospels. What do I mean by that? There are four gospels. doesn't mean there are four gospel messages. It just means there are four uh, Four gospel writers uh, who are presenting the gospel message, the one gospel message, through differing viewpoints. Um, and John is very familiar with those writings. They've been out there for a little lo- longer. He seems to uh, refer to those in different ways throughout this book. But John is different than the synoptics. Synoptics means similar. The other three are similar. The other three focus on, uh, on the ministry in Galilee. John starts out in Judea. So there are some differences in the way things are written. John includes things the others do not include. John includes uh, the blind man being healed. John talks about the bread of life. The others don't talk like this. John talks about the high priestly prayer. They don't mention that. John talks about the Samaritan woman. John talks about the Trinity. John centers his, his uh, uh, book around seven miracles. The others have much, many more miracles than that in their books. But that just shows you the difference in perspective, but he wanted to complement what the others had done. He wasn't to contra- there's no contradictions whatsoever. It gives a complete picture of Christ and his ministry and his, his reasons for coming. So the four Gospels are meant to do that. And, and you say, well, what's the purpose of the book? Well, you know, you, it'd be really hard if you read the book to say, well, what's the theme? And well, John makes this really easy for us. And he tells us, turn to John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, verse 30, And, and this is important because this is, this is what I want you to see this morning. I want you to see this theme. I want you to see this theme as it's presented um, throughout this, this book. But you must see what the theme is. And he says it for us in verse 30. Therefore, many other signs also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. In other words, G- John is saying there are many other things that Jesus did and they're not going to be written in this book. In fact, he says in the very last verse of the book, volumes could not hold everything that Jesus did. But John says here he was very particular of what he included in the Gospel of John. He was very particular in what he, and intentional in what he put in here. And then he tells you why. Because this is the reason for the book. But these things, excuse me, but these have been written so that you may believe, notice, that Jesus is the Christ, Messiah, Christ, Messiah, means the same thing, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. My purpose is this, John says, is to convince you that Jesus is the Messiah and the Christ, and also that you might believe that he is the Son of God. See, it's a two-part theme. Messiah, Son of God. He wants his readers to know that he is the one the Scripture said would be the Messiah. He fulfills all those prophecies in the Old Testament that the Christ, the Messiah, would fulfill certain prophecies, and this Christ, this Jesus fulfilled those, but also Son of God. And this is going to be a major, major point throughout the book of John, the deity of Christ. When you say son of God, sometimes you you can take it at different levels. Son of God means he was virgin born, means that he had a a earthly father, which was not, he was not the son of that father, but he had a, a physical human father that raised him, but not in the physical sense. Um, 
But you can also use the Son of God another way, line of David. The Son of God or the Messiah came from the line of David. Psalm 2, pay homage to the Son from the line of David. But John takes it to a higher level in his writing. Look at verse 18 of chapter 5. Turn to 518. It's not just virgin born. It's not just line of David. When we talk son of God in the book of John. Verse 18 of chapter 5 says this. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father. Notice, making himself equal with God. And that's exactly what Jesus does. Exactly what Jesus does in this book. Makes himself equal with God because he is equal with God. We say we are sons of Adam meaning that we are descendants of Adam and also we share Adam's nature. When you claim to be the son of God, you are saying you're one in essence and you have the same nature. And that's the claim that Jesus is going to make. And they knew this. They knew he was claiming to be God. That is why they wanted to kill him. That is why they were, that is why they were seeking his life and to destroy him blasphemy, claiming that you are God. And they called it blasphemy. Jesus is God in a body. That's the point. Jesus is God in a body. Just let that sink in. We sometimes just live in a fantasy world about these kinds of things. Sometimes I think, oh, that's, that's to happen back then. But just think about God in a body coming into this world we beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father. John says, I'm writing these things to you so you will know that Jesus is God himself. He wants you to know that Jesus is God himself. He's the Christ, but he's also God. Find a Bible. You're going to follow along with me. I'm going to do you a quick survey of this book. We may not get through the whole thing, but I want to highlight, here's the point. The point of this is to highlight this theme in several places. All right? So turn to John 1. John chapter 1. Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is God. You have two responses going on here, belief and unbelief. Follow with me, John 1.1. 1, 1. Just gets right to it. Just gets right to it. This just don't, uh, this is put it up front. In the beginning was the Word. The Word refers to Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was full deity. Is God with God? Eternity passed. Before the world began, puts it right up front. My reason for writing this, right there. Go to verse 19. John the Baptist declared him. And other disciples declared him. People thought he was the Messiah. Verse 20, John the Baptist says, I am not the Christ. Go down to verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This one is the Savior. This is the one I've been telling you about. This verse 29. He will do what was predicted in the Old Testament. Go down to verse 32. John testified saying, I've seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and remained on him. He is the anointed one. I'm not him. This is the one. Go to verse 33. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Verse 34. I myself have seen, notice, and have testified that this is the Son of God. 
Back up at verse 20, he's the Christ, he's the Son of God. That's our theme. That's our two-part theme. Christ, the Son of God, that you might believe that. This one is the Messiah. This one is deity. Go to verse 40, his disciples. Verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we've found the Messiah. Verse 45, Philip found Nathanael. We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. Go to verse 49. Nathanael's skeptical? I don't think so. I doubt it. I have doubts. And Jesus tells him where he first saw him under a tree. And notice what Nathanael says in verse 49. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Are you catching the theme here? Okay? You are Messiah. You are Son of God. Everything you're going to see now. We're going through this whole thing, but folks, just hang on to your pew. Because I want you to see, see this over and over again. 211. Miracles just strengthened this. This is, the, this is the wedding at Cana. One verse in chapter 2. I'm going to highlight. This is what he, 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 the miracle just proves it. As we begin to see these miracles. This is the first of the miracles. Verse 11. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. I have written these things that you might believe. This convinced these, believe, these disciples, and they believed. Not just the disciples. Go to chapter 3. Not just the disciples who saw this and were convinced. There was a man named Nicodemus. This is not in the other Gospels. This scene here is not in the other Gospels. John 3, 1 and 2. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He was the teacher in in Israel, a prominent teacher in Israel. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He's he's not there yet, but he's on his way to understanding. He's on his way. Evidence from the signs that he's seen and the things he's heard. Go to chapter 4. This is the story of the Samaritan woman. This too does not appear in the other Gospels. John chapter 4. Look at verse 17. You recall the Samaritan woman. She's amazed. She is amazed that this man at the well knows her past. She is amazed that he has this unlearned information about her. She is amazed. The woman answered and said, I have no husband, because he's asked about her husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. That's a good answer. Verse 18, for you have five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, verse 19, I perceive that you are a prophet. There's something unique about you. You have this unlearned information, this unlearned knowledge that only God could have. You're a prophet. Go to verse 25. Back and forth, question, answer. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus makes this statement, this very open declaration to this woman, I who speak to you am he. Folks, you, if you break this down, there's a lot of English words put in here, but basically this is an I am statement. I am. I am. It's a declaration to this prostitute of who Jesus is. I am he. I am he. So so a hint that he is God. Go to verse 28. The woman left her water pot and she went to the city and she said to the men, very excitedly, come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? 
Verse 39. From that city, many of the Samaritans, notice, believed in him because of the word of the woman, what she testified. Verse 42. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard it for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Listen. John wants you to understand who Jesus is. He is the Christ. He is God. He does and knows things that only God knows and does. And they believe. Verse 49, you meet a royal official. His child is dying. He calls on Jesus to go and heal his child. Jesus tells him he's being healed. And the man runs home, verse 52. Uh, verse 51, as he's running home, his slaves met him, saying that your son was living. He inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. Then they said to him, he got better that seventh hour. So the father knew that at that hour in which Jesus has said, your son lives, and he himself, notice, believed, and his household. It's been good news up to chapter 4. 1 through 4, very positive. People see signs, people hear messages, and people believe. Things are about to change, though, when you come to chapter 5. It's been very positive. Now it's going to start to mix it up a little bit. In chapter 5, verse 16, this is when Jesus heals the man at the pool of Bethsaida, who'd been sick for 38 years. He, he heals this man. In verse 16, the problem is he did it on the Sabbath. This is John 5, 16. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now. My father, God is my father, and I myself am working by divine imitation, divine imitation. I am working, God is working, God is working and doing good things like this on the Sabbath. I do what God does. Verse 18, for this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. John's purpose, Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is God. Some believe and some don't believe. And then at the end of chapter 5, he just gives four testimonies to who he is. Verse 33 John the Baptist testified to the truth. Verse 36, my very works testify to the truth of who I am that my Father has sent me. That's verse 36. Verse 37, and the Father who sent me has testified of me. In verse 39, he says this, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote, he wrote about me. He says, you don't like my claims to be the, you don't like me making the claim to be the son of God. You don't like me making the claim to, that God is my father. He says, these all testify of me. John the Baptist did, my works did, my father does, and the scriptures do. Moses wrote about me. Then he goes to John chapter 6, and he talks about the miracles, the, the, another miracle, a major miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. And uh, the, in verse 11, Jesus took these loaves, took this sack lunch, basically, and giving thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also the fish as much as they wanted. Verse 14, therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So is that belief? Is that a belief? 
No, Jesus says, this is not true belief. Verse 15, so Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Jesus says, I am not here on a political agenda. I am not here to be crowned a king. I'm not here to be a political messiah. That was what they wanted him to be. That what they wanted Jesus on their terms, that is not true faith. He would not accept their pseudo belief, their selfishly motivated belief. Verse 26, move on down the oh, verse 20, verse 15. So Jesus perceiving that uh, withdrew to the mountain. Verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves that were feel, filled. You just wanted a free meal. That's all you wanted. You want a Messiah that will give you food and you don't have to work for. That's the kind of food you want. You just want that kind of king, that kind of Lord. Look at verse 35. Then Jesus gives a sermon about him being the bread of life. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Verse 51, I am the living bread. I'm not like the manna in the wilderness that dried up, died, evaporated, or whatever, that made you hungry again. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And this is too much. This is overwhelming for people to hear and the audience to hear that day. And you see their unbelief. Therefore, many of the disciples, they could not process this. When they heard this, they said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? And they turned away. Verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. They followed him because they were fascinated with his miracles, fascinated with him as a person, whatever the reasons may be, whatever reasons a lot of us have at times why we follow Jesus, what we can get rather than to give our lives and to embrace him as our Lord. They were not willing. Verse 67, so Jesus said to the 12, he doesn't care about the crowd. I could care less about a crowd. I look at my 12, the 12. I say, are you guys going to leave too? Are you guys going to leave also? Peter responds and says, where are you going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Then verse 69, he says this, we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Our theme. All of that to get to our theme. But that's our theme. In chapter 7, not even his brothers were believing. Oh, let me back up for a second. Go back to chapter 6 again, verse 65. I want to say this. No one can come to me, Jesus says, unless it's granted by the Father. Because it's all of grace, folks. Look at verse 65. No one can come to me unless granted by the Father. Look at verse 44. No one comes unless he's drawn by the Father. Understand that. A lot of people saw the same evidences. A lot of people saw the same Jesus working and doing things, and they didn't believe. But those that did believe, it's because the Father was doing something to draw them. Understand that. Salvation is initiated by God by doing a work in the heart that sees the glory of Christ. Everybody didn't see his glory. Everybody, everybody who was in the audience didn't see it. It's not because those that believe were smarter. It's because those that believed had their eyes opened. God did a work in their heart. That's an important chapter. John 7, not even his brothers were believing in him. Look at verse 5. They rejected him. At this point, later on, they will believe in him, but they rejected him, for not even his brothers were believing in him. That's verse 5. Go down to verse um, 26. He was speaking publicly uh, in the temple. They were saying nothing to him. The religious leaders were letting him get away with it. The rulers did not really know that this is the Christ, do they? See, the issue is at stake. Is this really the king? Is this really the Messiah? Verse 27 However, however, we know where this man is from. 
But whenever the Christ may come, no one knows where he is from. Jesus cried out from the temple, verse 28, teaching and saying, you both know me and know where I am from, and I have come, not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him because, notice, I am from him and he sent me. And you get a divided response on this as well. Verse 30, they were seeking to seize him, but no one laid hand on him because his hour had not yet come. But many in the crowd believed in him. When the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than what this man has done, will he? Chapter 7, verse 40, some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, this is certainly the prophet Others were saying, this is the Christ. Others were saying, this surely the Christ is not coming from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem? So division occurred. There were some who believed and some who wanted to seize him. And then chapter, chapter 8, Therefore I said in verse 24, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he. The he is added. Understand that. The he is added. To make things clear in our English. But the I am connects it to Exodus 3. Connects it to when Moses asks, who shall I say is sending me? And at the burning bush, he says, I am. Making a declaration of being deity. I am. I am he. You will die in your sins. Go down to verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, How can you say Abraham rejoiced to see your day when you're not even 50 years old? Have you seen Abraham? And Jesus once again says, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Not I was, I am. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is equal to God. I existed fully and completely and eternally. I am eternally God. That's John's purpose over and over again. Look at chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus heard they had put him out. This is the blind man that was healed. And he got put out of the synagogue because he believed in Jesus, or at least he was affirmative toward Jesus and saying that he healed him. They put him out of the synagogue, and Jesus heard that they had put him out. And finding him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Verse 37, Jesus said to him, You have both seen him. Well, at verse 36, he says, Who is he? Jesus said in verse 37, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe and he worshiped him. I'm trying to do here, understand, is trying to see the theme, the thread that runs through this book. Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is God. I say these, wrote these things so that you might believe. Because the only other option is not to believe. And many do that as well. Chapter 10 of John. He says, verse 30, I and the Father are one. Verse 30, I and the Father are one. He makes that claim. The Jews respond. They pick up stones to stone him. They know what he's saying. Sometimes you hear, sometimes people have said he never claimed to be God. That's not true. We've seen it over and over again. He claimed to be God. The Jews knew what he was claiming when he made these statements. Verse 32, Jesus answered them, I show you many good works from the Father for which of which of them are you stoning me? Why? Healing a guy? Are you stoning me for that? What are you stoning me for? The Jews answered, it's not because of good works that you have done that we stone you, but it's for blasphemy. It's because you being a man make yourself out to be God. In chapter 11, this is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Um, Lazarus is sick. Lazarus dies. He raises Lazarus from the... He, he, he meets uh, Lazarus' sis, um, a sister. Sister, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. That's verse 25, John eleven twenty-five. 25. 
He says in verse 26, everyone who believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she says, I believe you are Christ and the Son of God. I believe you are the Messiah, and I believe you are God. Go down to verse 44. The man who died, Lazarus, is the one who died. He came forth after he had been risen from the dead. As Jesus called him forth from the dead, the man who died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings. His face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Verse 45, therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. Jesus came, performed this miracle, and some believed, and others did not. Verse 53, they planned together to kill him. He just raised someone from the dead. Let's kill him. How does that work? He just raised someone from the dead. We got to do something about let's kill him. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But chapter 12, basically, uh, chapter 12 is just simply about the Greeks desiring to see Jesus. Chapter 12 is about for uh, Jesus talking about the going to the cross. Jesus talking about this is the purpose that I came for in verse 27. Verses 13 through 17 is a large section of teaching in the book of John. That's called the Upper Room Discourse. That is the washing of the disciples' feet. That is teaching on the Holy Spirit. That is uh, teaching this in John 14. Let me look, just look at John 14. Just highlight one thing in John 14. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. He's telling them, he's gonna, I'm going to be leaving you. Believe in God. Believe also in me. I'm going away, and they're starting to panic. He says, don't worry, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'll come back and get you. And Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way, rather. We don't know the way. And Jesus says in verse 6 of John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. But in verse 8, John says, uh, verse 8, Philip says something interesting. 14, 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Lord, give us some grand vision of God. Lord, give us some grand event here that will just carry us through this trial. Just give us some vision of you, God the Father, Isaiah-type vision to carry us through this trial. And Jesus said in verse 9, "Have Have I been so long with you, yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? How can you say, show us the Father, when I'm standing right here in front of you? The Word was with God, and the Word is God. Go down to chapter 18. Flip over to chapter 18. Just skimming now, as you notice. Skimming. Verse in chapter 18 Jesus knowing all the things that were coming upon him 18.4 went forth and said to them whom do you seek so when he said to them I am once again I am he I am they fall back um, I think once again you have a statement of deity but we've got a few couple years before we get to that but that's a statement of deity I am God Verse 19, excuse me, chapter 19, that's the trial before Pilate. The crucifixion is in that chapter as well, chapter 19. Um, He made himself out to be the son of God, and that's why the Jews at his trial said about him, what have you got against this man, Pilate said? And he says, he makes himself out to be the son of God. Pilate didn't have a problem with that. (laughs) There are lots of gods. But the Jews did, and he felt the pressure from the Jews, and he crucified him. But he was making the claim that he was Messiah. He was making the claim that he was God. And then chapter 20 of John, this is with Thomas. This is the resurrection. They rush to the tomb. Mary's there. Jesus shows himself to his disciples eventually. And then Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas who's doubting, Reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put them in my side. This is verse 27. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. 
Okay, and then verse 28 is the summary of the whole book, okay? The summary of the whole book. Verse 28, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. That's the gospel of John right there. My Lord and my God. You are the Lord, you are the King, and you are God, a very God. And then verse 30, John summarizes the whole gospel again, summarizes his reason once again. We read it earlier. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also, excuse me, yeah, yeah. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Jesus is God and Jesus is Messiah. It's written to fuel faith in Christ. That's what this book is written about, written for, to fuel your faith in Christ, to believe and trust in Christ, and that Christ is Lord, King, Messiah, and He is God. And when you, as we're going through this book, it's going to be saving faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ by grace alone. Like I said earlier, there are going to be confused crowds, confused skeptics. They have all this evidence. They don't believe. And it's only because of the work of the Holy Spirit that they're able to behold the glory that's in their midst. The Second Corinthians tells us that the one thing that Satan has done is blinded us to that glory. The Holy Spirit comes and opens our eyes that we might believe. We'll see that as we go through this. But if you have not believed in Jesus, I believe the study will be very important to you. I will believe it will bring you face to face with Christ. I believe it will show you the sacrificial lamb that we celebrate today in the Lord's table. And that will, it will, it will just encourage you in the fact that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. Because what you believe about Christ is the most important thing. The most important thing. Father, I thank you for this written word that we've been able to look at together this morning. I thank you for the great truths that this gospel have has for us to consider together as a church in the coming months. I thank you, Father, for uh, sending Jesus, sending him into the world to be that Lamb of God, that sacrifice for our sin, that we might have forgiveness, that we might have access into the very presence of Holy God, that we might have life in his name. We live in a day and time where there's a lot of hopelessness, we're so thankful, God, that you've given us hope in Christ. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.